And um, now it's time for me to bring in our final speaker for tonight, who is our own Alan Johnson from the Limerick Regional Veterinary Laboratory. And uh, Alan qualified as a vet in UCD in 1991, and he spent five years in mixed practice in Derry and Strabane in County Tyrone. He moved to Limerick Regional Veterinary Laboratory to complete a master's degree with UCD in 1996. He then took up a role as research officer with uh, the Limerick RVL in 1998, and he currently manages the RVL in his role as senior research officer. So he lives on a dairy farm in County Limerick, and he's married with uh, three children. Now, Alan, I can see your screen very clearly. I can see you very clearly, and I'm confident that I'll be able to hear you. So are you okay to take the presentation from here, please? I am, Michael. Can you hear me? I can hear yeah. you loud and clear. Thanks very much. Oh, perfect. Thanks very much, Michael. And thanks to the previous speaker. It's very interesting. I, I absolutely. Really enjoyed the, the talks so far. And um, one, one of the main points I'm taking from it is the importance of the vet farmer relationship. And that's the point I want to take on further here um, because of our role in the regional veterinary labs. So just to describe a bit about the regional vet labs for those who aren't familiar with the work they do. There are six regional vet labs around the country, strategically placed um, to cover as much of the country as possible. We have uh, Limerick, Cork, Kilkenny, Dublin, Athlone and Sligo. And um, typically the staff complement in a regional vet lab is roughly 11 or 12 staff to include three vets, four analysts, two clerical and two attendants. And that's, uh, that's uh, a picture taken in Kilkenny lab some years ago. So the importance of the connection from the regional vet lab to the veterinary practices is displayed here. Um, for example, Sligo Lab is linked to roughly 127 veterinary practices in the district. And the connection from the veterinary practices then to the farm is equally important. This, this um, spot here is a veterinary practice in Ballina and County Mayo, and that is shows the connection to all its farmer clients around 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 that practice. So the, the connection from the regional vet lab to every farm in the country is what, what I'm talking about here and how important that is. Because this network of connections and by providing a diagnostic service, the RVLs carry out animal health surveillance on behalf of the Department of Agriculture. We're looking for the incursion of exotic diseases for new and emerging diseases. And, and of course, as was mentioned by Tom, Tommy and uh, Connor earlier, we're looking for changes in the patterns in endemic diseases. So we're working to detect and investigate disease threats early to protect animal health, human health, trade, and the environment. So when you think about exotic diseases, you're thinking about the main ones there that are topical at the moment, blue tongue and sheep and cattle, avian influenza and birds. We've had three cases in wild birds in the last of highly pathogenic avian influenza in the last two weeks. And African swine fever and pigs, which is on the continent at the moment. But I suppose the main one we think about when, it, when we think about exotic disease is foot and mouth disease in cattle, sheep and pigs. And the last outbreak was in 2001 in Ireland. It was picked up early, luckily enough. And even though it was localized in one region on the Cooley Peninsula, the estimated cost to the economy of that outbreak was 210 million. So there, this is a, a triangle to show the relationship we have with, with vets and farmers and how we gather our data, our surveillance data. So basically all the full animal population is there at the bottom, the sick and relying on the farmer to pick up the sick animals treat those animals and then maybe involve the vet who may then sample the animal and the sample is sent into the RVL or the animal itself sent into the RVL. And we use that surveillance data um, to gather information on the Department of Agriculture. Um, so the typical RVL submissions are clinical pathology samples, blood, milk, fecal samples and other type of samples and then carcasses for post-mortem. So the cost of the post-mortem is subsidized by the Department of Agriculture. So the biggest investment for the farmer is not the cost of the post-mortem, but it is the time that it takes the farmer to bring the animal to the, to the regional vet lab for that post-mortem, particularly in the busy season. That can cause a lot of problems for the farmer. So 
that distance from the RVL is the single most important reason why a farmer will or will not have a post-mortem carried out. So the map of Ireland there on the right shows for 2019 where the carcass submissions came from for each RVL. And as you can see, the further you get away from an RVL, the less likely is for the farmer to bring in bring in the animal for post-mortem. So there are, there are some gaps here in the map of Ireland where um, animals are not really, we're not getting a good picture of what is happening on, on the farms. So the Department of Agriculture have a plan in place to improve this and develop the, uh, the regional laboratory service further by building some carcass transfer centers in those, in those counties where the, where, the, where the submission rate ha has been low. So the plans over the next couple of years are to develop these. The importance of submitting an animal for a post-mortem examination can't be stressed enough. Obviously, it can hopefully lead to a definitive diagnosis, but it can lead to action to prevent further deaths and protect animal welfare. In 2019, we roughly carried out about 3,800 bovine postmortems, and that varied from the premature calves, the aborted bovine fetuses, to young calves, to weanlings, and young adults, and then adults. So, a little bit about some recent trends. Um, this is a, a sequence of um, maps covering covering the years from 2010 to 2019 showing the percentage of salmonella-associated bovine abortions submitted, submitted to the regional vet labs. So as you can see, in 2010, there are quite a lot of red dots here on the map showing a high number of salmonella-associated bovine abortions. Move on, and you can see the number of dots is dropping significantly to 2019, when the number of salmonella-associated bovine abortions is quite low. Salmonella Dublin abortions are quite common at this time of the year. So we get a lot of aborted bovine fetuses submitted. I suppose it's associated with the stage of pregnancy and the time of year, and particularly stressful time when cows are housed. So why the reduction? Well, we've been looking at it. We haven't come to a clear answer answers yet, but the involvement of the BVD eradication scheme, I think um, Tommy and Connor were referring to BVD and the immunosuppressive effect of BVD, possibly associated with a reduction in salmonella abortions, and of course the salmonella vaccination, which um, is, is, is quite common on farms and um, on, on, on more farms than ever now. This is a, a table sort of showing the same thing. Um, it shows the percentage of, uh, of fetuses diagnosed with salmonella Dublin, from 2010, 14% of the fetuses were Salmonella Dublin associated. It dropped rapidly then towards 2012 and started steadied up as we went, we've gone on to 2019, where 4.4% of the aborted bovine fetuses have been associated with Salmonella Dublin. Now the blocks here show you the number of fetuses that were submitted to the labs each year. So you can see it has dropped from about 2,500 bovine fetuses in 2010, down to about 1,500 in 2019. We have noticed since brucellosis has, has been eradicated that the number of fetuses being submitted to the laboratories has dropped. So we tr we're trying to encourage farmers and vets to continue to submit fetuses. Just two little um, spots uh, that we've, we've, we've put into the graph here are um, the, the Schmalenberg virus outbreak when it first started and was detected in Ireland in 2012 and caused problems in different herds for the subsequent couple of years and when the BVD eradication program began in 2013. So I just wanted to talk a, a bit now about um, some cases from the post-mortem room, particularly associated with animals with, that have been found dead. Obviously for a farmer, going out in the morning, finding an animal dead can be a big shock and be worry for other animals and a big financial loss. So finding the cause of death is important to prevent further losses. And it is important that the farmer engages the vet and that the vet involves the laboratory or tries to come to an answer to prevent further losses. So a little bit about poisoning. 
Uh, rather than going down into too much detail about infectious um, causes of death, I just said I thought I'd say a little bit about poisoning, which is commonly diagnosed in, in cases of sudden death submitted for post-mortem to the RVLs. Typically, we get about 60 cases a year, lead being the most common cause of poisoning diagnosed. So um, the lead battery um, is the most important source, or is the most common source. Um, maybe a battery taken out of a car or a tractor, um, discarded on the farm, not disposed of properly. For the first couple of years, probably isn't a problem. There's an, a good, strong plastic cover around the, the lead battery. But as the years go on, maybe it's battered, something breaks open the plastic, and then the lead is exposed. This was a case of lead poisoning in the weaning we encountered in the regional vet lab in Limerick. It was from a suckler farm in County Clare where two weanling deaths had occurred. The second animal was sent into the RVL and lead poisoning with, was diagnosed within hours. So the farmer and the vet had an answer. So the search immediately started for, for the source. Of course, looked for the lead battery in the ditches or something. Uh, but what complicated the, the history here was that there was a history of lead poisoning in the area or, or lead mining in the area for the last years and years. Um, so there was a suspicion around environmental contamination. So we involved the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, at that stage, and um, we, we sought their advice. Look for the discarded lead car battery, but nothing was found. And then another weaning death occurred. So we had three animal deaths. So we still couldn't find the source until eventually we did. And, and um, it... it, it we found it quite by chance. The farmer was topping the field where the deaths had occurred, and um, he hit something on the ground with the topper. And as he, as he was going past, there was a flash uh, of glass on the ground, and he investigated further. And there was um, exposed some lead in the ground. So he got um, a local contractor to come in, and he dug out a very large old battery from the ground that had been dumped there years and years ago before. As it turned out, his, his grandfather had worked in a big house locally, and before rural electrification had occurred, batteries were used, and one was buried on the farm along with other rubbish. So the farmer, when he, when he hit that with the topper exposed, exposed some lead, and um, it had to be all dug up and disposed of properly. So other poisoning cases from the post-mortem room, carbohydrate, carbohydrate overload, very common. We we test the pH of um, of the room and contents, and um, acute acidosis is, is is very frequently diagnosed, um, usually associated with um, overload with carbohydrates, animals getting access to grain or other concentrate feed. Copper poisoning is associated typically with uh, excess supplementation. It causes liver damage and jaundice. Some poisonous plants that we see in the RVLs. This is a case um, from Kilkenny RVL last summer. It actually resulted in over 22 weanling deaths over one single weekend. Laurel leaves were found in the stomachs of two animals submitted, and uh, we took some. They took some blood samples from from some of the in contact animals, and those were sent off to Paris for testing, and they were high in cyanide. So we're fairly confident that the diagnosis di di diagnosis was associated with laurel leaf poisoning. This is a picture of the of the fence and the laurel bushes that were on that were at the boundary of the field where the animals died. And the animals had been picking at those laurel leaves. Other poisonous plants, in this case cattle breaking into a garden where the Pieris plant uh, shrub was growing. This is a picture of the of the leaves that were pulled out of the stomach of the animal. And that's a picture of the Pieris plant growing. Other ones um, commonly seen are the yew tree poisoning, cuttings from a hedge maybe thrown into a field of um, an, from, into the field from a neighbouring, you know, premises. Often, often the the neighbour might cut branches off a tree and unwittingly throw them in, thinking that the animals would like to eat them. So it's very important that farmers are aware of what is around them. You know what what you know, especially with people living next next to the farms and what they might be growing in their gardens. 
at this time of the year, particularly in cattle that aren't housed yet, there is a higher risk of poisoning occurred because there's little grass to eat and the animals are hungry. A lot of these poisonous plants, the animals will not eat if, if there's plenty of grass there. I'm talking particularly about bracken or um, plants like hemlock, water dropwort. Ragwort tends not to be a problem in graze, you know, at this time of the year in animals grazing, but it can be a big problem if ragwort has been inside, if ragwort has been ensiled and is in the silage and the cattle are eating it because they will not eat, they will eat it, whereas um, when it's growing, they will eat around it. So a couple of take home messages. Um, in the case of infectious and other diseases, early intervention can prevent further cattle losses. So it's important to get in early and get a diagnosis. Involve your veterinary practitioner early and use the RVLs through your veterinary practitioners. Thanks a million. Thanks very much for that, Alan. And uh, fair play to you. That was a very interesting talk. I think uh, maybe for yourself who works in the lab every day and every week, the, what goes on there may become humdrum at times, but I think for the rest of us, it is absolutely fascinating to see the kind of things you see. And uh, I suppose the common thread between your talk and the others really is that uh, if you can get to the bottom of the issue, you're on the front foot to deal with it and you can save other animals and you can avoid production losses and animal losses, of course.